Welcome to the Camera Settings Seminar. There are several settings in 2D and 3D we'll cover to help you gain a better understanding. For both camera styles, we'll review the key settings and how to set the defaults you can use in your template plan. We'll review the render techniques such as the Physically Based Render, or PBR, and Standard Renders, cover depth queuing and depth of field, and finally, how to clip elevation or section views to extended rooms or shaped ceilings. If you'd like to follow along with this session or repeat the steps, I will be using mainly the Silverton sample plan that you can download from our webpage, chiefarchitect.com samples. Let's begin by reviewing the key settings and how to set the defaults you can use in your template plan. Underneath the default settings are two key areas we're going to review. One is the 3D view defaults, the other one is the camera tools. Underneath 3D view defaults, let's begin with the 3D view panel. These default settings are typical that you would get out of the box and usually I don't make many changes in here. Underneath the general options, the camera bumps off of walls. If you're navigating the camera, this setting will then make it so that the camera moves around the walls rather than going through them. The next setting, auto rebuild walls, floors, and ceilings. If you've made changes in your model, you take a 3D view, it will force a rebuild of the model. Typically a good thing. Skip over the legacy information. Here's one that's a little interesting. Auto adjust electrical default glass properties. In the view that I have behind me, you see how this recess can light has a bright white on it? If that light isn't turned on, then you can set that up to have the light show up in the glass as emissive or illuminated. And that's what that setting is about. Always display active cameras. Your camera view is on a layer. As I kind of bring up this image here, you can see in this view behind me, the camera that's active is being shown. If you want to turn that off so you can zoom in in your plan view while having a 3D view open and not have that camera stepping on something, then you can turn off this setting here to always display active cameras. That just means a camera that's open won't be displayed. The last setting down here, display openings independent of walls and roofs. If you have the layer turned on for doors and windows and you're taking a 3D view, maybe you've turned off the layer for walls, then that will control if the doors and windows are being displayed. If it's set up to be independent, they will always be on even if your wall layer is turned off. For surface edge lines, the check here, use layer settings. Your layers control, typically maybe in black, what those edge lines are. You can override that and uncheck use layer settings if you want to make changes there. The next setting as we work our way up is underneath sunlight. When you take an initial 3D view, this is how your view will be controlled. This one's set up to use a generic sun. You can control the intensity of the sun and the color of the sun by changing the color information here. You can also adjust the intensity if you don't want it with a number out of this drop-down. You can type in a value over here. Sun follows camera. That means the sun will always kind of be behind the camera. I like to use that maybe for exterior views. You uncheck that. You can then adjust the tilt and direction angle. If you're using sun angle specifically, you can see in the drop down that I have here, I have a collection of sun angles and that means pick one of those when you take an initial 3D view. The next setting is for CPU ray trace. The renderer that I have up behind the dialogs here is using the physically based ray trace. That's also considered the GPU ray trace that's happening on my video card. CPU ray trace takes place on your processor and can give you different results, especially for exteriors that may be more attractive in some cases over the physically based GPU ray trace and it's also a nice option if your computer does not support the GPU ray trace. I've saved off several different configurations. As you drop this down you can see that I have several of them. These are more intensive and take longer than the GPU. You notice that I have some that are pretty small outdoor 400 pixels is what that means and then you see that the next one down here is 1080 pixels. This is in the height direction. And I've named each one of these that are optimized. If we just kind of open one of these up here, and then I'll go ahead and edit this. You can see the height and width information as well as the resolution. 
There's also lighting information, advanced, and image properties. These are all settings that I've dialed in over time, and I like to carry these forward between plan to plan. These different configurations that I have in here can be downloaded from the Silverton sample plan on the website if you wanted to look at these. Usually I'll set one up at a small resolution, either for indoor or outdoor, maybe a few 360 ones that I have down here. And then if I need them, they're built into my template plan and they're ready to go and I can easily use these. The next setting is to look at the different rendering techniques. For the rendering techniques, I want to take a look at standard, physically based, and clay. Beginning with standard, you can set this up to be your default and then modify it as you need to for your particular render style view you're after. Underneath the general category, use a backdrop if you have that set up. Opaque glass if you want to make sure that that's obscured and not see through. Maybe good for exteriors depending on what you're setting up. Ambient light settings. I don't make too many changes to this. Maybe for an interior scene I might adjust this. And then hand drawing on top. I usually will come in and make these settings. I like a very, very thin line. And this is about as small as I can get. And then for the extend and amplitude and frequency, I set that to zero. I usually will make these changes and then turn it off. Line drawing is computationally expensive in all the rendering techniques. I don't have this on as a default, but I do change these settings so that I can toggle it on. And if I show you an example here, here's one without the line drawing on, and then here's one with line drawing on. I typically will always have the line drawing off for editing because it's much faster not to have the line drawing on. For physically based rendering, notice that at the end of mine it says ray trace. If you want to check and see if your computer supports ray tracing. I'll digress here and show you in the preferences where that setting is located. In your preference settings toward the bottom on video card status, you can see a area called hardware ray tracing. It says yes. That means that your computer does in fact support ray tracing. If you want to learn a little bit more about what computer requirements, you can see that area on the website under system requirements. A few settings I want to touch on underneath the physically based. It'll be pretty similar when we talk about clay. For exposure, I typically will set this at 0.3. Again, this is the default that I start with. Depending on the scene, I may change that to be higher. 0.3 is a good number. If your computer supports ray tracing, you can change this check mark to use ray tracing. If I'm using physically based, I typically will always have ray tracing on. I'm going to get a much better result, especially for interior scenes. Refraction, how light goes through glass. Use soft sun shadows, typically check. The number of export samples, this is the number of passes typically that are going to go through your model. If I'm going to save off a rendering, I might increase this up to maybe 100, but typically my default is going to be 25. That means it's going to take 25 passes. Then if I cap it, the check mark down below, it will stop at 25 passes. And then the denoise option, you see how I have a wine room with glass. A lot of times you'll get speckles. The denoise will take that out and remove the speckles. Depending on your backdrop, your intensity, amount of light that's coming from it, you'll need to change this. My default is set to 1000. Typically, if I'm going to be using a backdrop or a generated sky model, I'll need to make adjustments. And then the same for the nighttime backdrop intensity. Again, it's scene specific. These are the defaults that I typically use. Color adjustment, I don't spend a lot of time in here. And then just like the standard rendering, hand drawing on top, I will typically always leave this off and then set the values in here for a very thin line, no extension, amplitude, or frequency. You can see an example here with this kitchen with line drawing off and then line drawing on. So it can give you a nice view with the line drawing on. I typically always have it off because it's computationally expensive. Clay, pretty similar settings. The exposure, I do crank that up, 0.8 in here. The layer color, if you want to use the layer color, this is based on a layer. I'll show you an example of that. I typically will set that up. If you look at this image I have in here, I'll show you the details of this. But I've used the layers to maybe isolate particular views and I can put colors on those. Then I don't do much with the material information. 
You can always learn about what each of these do underneath the help file. It's context sensitive and it will define everything inside of this dialog box. If your computer supports ray tracing, Clay will support that. Same as the PBR settings, how many passes it's going to go through with the export samples. Cap that, denoise it, remove speckles out of such things as glass. And then line drawing on top. You might notice in my example I have a little bit thicker line for the thickness. And then I've removed off the amount, amplitude, and frequency. This is all subjective, so you can mess around and dial this in based on your preferences. The default settings in your camera are defaults. When you have a particular 3D view up, oftentimes you're going to need to change those to dial it in depending on the type of your scene. I mentioned earlier about using layer colors for the clay view. Let's move in and take a look at how you can make that adjustment. First thing I'm going to point you to is I've already created a custom layer set called 3D Camera and then I put the word clay after it. The Z in front of it is just for sorting. That layer set is off to the side and typically in a 3D view layer set most of your colors are going to be black or they may be white. I've made a few adjustments in here to colorize certain things that we'll look at when I change my rendering style to clay. Let's move over and use the Edit Active View tool. The Edit Active View tool gives you a peek into being able to change almost everything about your rendering style. So the first thing I want to do is come down and look at changing the rendering technique from the physically based to clay. Then let's go in and hit the Define button and on the clay panel you can see underneath the color I've got the check mark here, the button for use layer color. That means it's going to use these layer colors that we've set up and you may have noticed in behind here I've got the cabinet, the wall cabinet set up to be blue. So if I scroll down into those layer settings you'll see that the wall cabinets are actually blue. If we change this to use the custom color of white Everything will be white. There will be no changes. Let's just close this dialog and take a look at this scene. As we scroll over into our layer set and we come down and we're looking for the different colors, you can see the wall cabinets are set to be blue in this case. If I change that color, maybe we'll make it more brown based. That looks orange. It targets the wall cabinet, uses that color, and maybe can accentuate a particular feature you're trying to point out. You might also use it for new cabinets versus old cabinets and colorize those. You can put some of the wall cabinets on the new layer and then the older cabinets on an old layer if you have a design like that and then use these colors to kind of pinpoint the way it looks. If I switch this layer set back into the standard 3D camera which has all white for the layer color you can see that there's no differentiation and that would be the same in your settings. If I go back in, click the define button and use the custom color of white. So you can control your rendering technique with these layer colors and create some pretty unique views. Let's take a look at the default settings for your camera styles. Underneath your render camera are three different render styles. The perspective full overview, the perspective floor overview, and then the framing view. Let's take a look really at kind of these two settings in here. Underneath the defaults, for the full camera, which means when you use this camera, how is the view going to initially start out? Underneath the general category, show color, show watermark, I have color on, I have the watermark on, you can see down in the lower left. A lot of times when I export my images or my floor plan views, I like to have those branded. That means that's going to have that set up. The rendering technique style, the primary rendering technique is a standard view. That's typically fast to edit in. And then the alternate view, which is the fastest to edit in, is the vector view. You can generate that by using the alt or the right click when you drag your camera out. If you want to have shadows on and then raycasted shadows, usually that's the best. I typically will have these turned off since shadows can be expensive computationally. Reflections, I typically will have those turned off. Reflections are a function of mirrors, not per se of a reflection of coming off of a countertop. And then the bloom setting, again, a little bit of expense, really only a factor in the standard render. Edge smoothing when idle will make it a little bit crisper when the computer or the scene's not being navigated. 
and then the number of maximum lights. I don't usually have many of these on because if I'm editing, the quality of the scene isn't as important to me as the speed of the scene. When I want to save a camera, then I will probably build a light set, which will force the number of lights. If you take a look, I've got a number of light sets set up for this sample plan. Specifically, I want to control the lighting for a scene, the one that's behind the dialogue here, kitchen entry, the wine room, and the living room. It will force those lights and only those lights to be on. And then the options for field of view and clip surfaces. I usually have a pretty tight clip surfaces. If you're zooming in, you get close to an item like a chair or a cabinet, it will start to clip. I, many of the times the defaults are a little bit larger than I prefer, so I've set that up to be three inches. You might even set that to be one inch if you want to zoom in real close. And the field of view is how wide the angle is on the camera. All of the cameras over here on the left are going to have these same panels. So let's just continue through using the full camera defaults as the example. Underneath the positioning, if you want to position it 60 inches above the floor, the tilt angle, the navigation move amount can be helpful depending on how you're doing it. Below grade, if you're working on an elevation view or even a 3D perspective view, you can set it up to have below grade lines. If you look at this example I have in the elevation view, you can see that the dash line style can be helpful to identify where the grade is and everything below grade. A few other settings, if you've got a terrain perimeter, how it affects those lines or an absolute height, you can set that to be the case if you want to set it to be absolute. Selected defaults using a scale, maybe applicable, maybe more to a elevation view. And then the one that I'll change quite a bit, you notice that I actually have something that may be a little more unique than the default. When I use the 3D camera, I don't want the landscape to display. I'm focused on the house and my default view. I don't want to see the landscaping in there until I'm ready to save a camera. So you can control your layer sets. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this a little more when we're doing some of the other editing but I control this. Another one I use for the perspective floor overview camera. I have one called the 3D camera dollhouse. And what that does when you take a overhead view is it will hide things. I typically will put my electrical, as you see here, on a layer that is for electrical in the ceiling. Same thing for the speakers or smoke detectors I may have. I don't like to see those when I'm looking at the what I call the dollhouse view down into the scene. So I have that set up as my default camera view for the perspective floor overview. Underneath the plan display, you can control how you want your camera to display. If you want it to display on all floors, if you want it to display as a callout, in particular for elevation views, very appropriate here. If you're displaying it as a callout, you can control how you want that callout to look. And then the symbol size, focal indicator length, on the backdrop panel, you can select a default backdrop. I typically won't have one. I'll make that specific to the view. It slows down my rendering, and then I can make a nice clean view, adjust the backdrop when it's appropriate to save it. If you want to use a generated sky, there's a check mark here. You can control a variety of different scenes here. If you're using a spherical backdrop, you can also set that up. What layers your camera are going to go on? I will change that depending on what style of rendering I'm going to be doing. So I do change that one. And then the labels for your camera if you want to control the style and where your labels are going to be displayed for your cameras. Let's take a look at some of the other settings in the section and elevation cameras. When I use the cross-section camera to create an elevation, Underneath below grade, you can see that I'm actually using a different style. The selected defaults are set up to use the quarter inch scale, and then you can see the, all the individual defaults that show up here. If I'm using exterior elevations, I may change this over time. If I'm doing a maybe a CAD detail or something, I may change this. So every time I take a particular view, it may change. You can make adjustments in here. That way, every time you open up a camera, you don't have to make changes after the fact. On the plan display, you can see that I'm displaying these on all floors as a callout center, the callout size, not typically a backdrop. 
if we move back over and take a look at the back clip cross section. It's going to be pretty similar to the elevation. Below grade I may have turned that off for the line style to be different and then for wall elevations this is typically going to be something for a kitchen and bath view. You can see the selected defaults are set up to be kitchen and bath. If you're doing something different you could change that layer set to be something different if you're doing a ceiling style or something. And plan display is a call out and then the layer is going on particularly cameras and the kitchen and bath elevations that way I can control it in the plan view that I send out to the layout sheet where those cameras are being displayed in that floor plan view. I may not want all of these cameras in my general floor plan that I have set up. So a few different changes in here depending on how you're going to be using the cameras and then over time as you make changes you might make adjustments in those defaults that may help you save time when you take a particular view and how that works. Let's go ahead and close our default settings in our 3D view and look at a few of these things in practice. Let's begin with the perspective camera. Using the perspective camera if I click and drag this is going to generate a standard view. In the standard view as I kind of navigate around it's pretty quick. It's responsive. If I change this and edit the active view and we come over into the camera setting and click the define button and I turn on line drawing it's going to look pretty nice adding the additional line drawing on top of things. You may notice some of the pattern lines behind the cook hood. When I rotate this it's a little chunky in rotating it. It's slowing things down so I typically will not turn on the line drawing unless I want to export an image specifically to give to the client. Let's close that 3D view. When you're editing the vector view can be pretty quick. So I grab the same camera and I'm going to right click and drag the mouse. There's a little V on the camera. I'm going to pause there for a second before I release the camera. There's a little V on the camera which stands for vector view. And now I'm in the vector view. I can go ahead and do any of the editing in this view. So it's a nice way to set up an alternate view when you right click and drag or hold your alt key down and left click and drag to generate the vector style view. Let's take a look at the concept of adding the depth of filled and also depth queuing. You see the little round circle. It's a glass globe that I put in here for the purpose. Let's zoom out just a little bit. Then I'm going to change the camera style back to standard. So let's go ahead and switch this back to a standard or even a physically based camera style. So let's switch that over to the physically based. Then I'm also going to change the number of lights. Let's switch that over to the light set for the kitchen, bath, and living. One thing you're going to notice when you switch your rendering techniques around, you're going to have to typically adjust the sun. You can see that maybe the scene looks a little dark back towards the cook hood, maybe a little bright in front of the chairs. Underneath the edit active view, probably come down, turn on the show shadows, and also raycraft shadows just so it smooths it up a little bit, and then adjust the sunlight here. Currently it's set to be very bright. Works well for standard. That's a typical the maximum amount. And I may just adjust this down to a fairly small level because I don't want a ton of light coming in from that for this example. And then we'll set it up. You can see how the view comes in. You may also adjust the Sunfalls camera and then you can easily move that around if you decide to in your 3D view simply by clicking on the tool for the sun and then you can move that around and adjust it. So one of the things you can do with the depth of filled as I zoom out just a little bit and we focus on this globe, we rotate around, you can kind of see how that's set up. And you want to focus on that, maybe not the bright white, I don't have a backdrop in here, the bright white, and we go in and we adjust the fill to view. Let's go into the edit active view and there's a setting down here that says depth of filled. Let's go ahead and enable this. Then there is a f-stop value. If you're a camera person you probably understand what that is. There's the help button down here that will describe it. And then you can also set the focal distance. And I might just adjust that to be 48 inches. So that we're more focused on that globe. And then the depth of f-stop value, if you want to increase that up, you can tighten it up or you can make it more blurry. You can also make this same adjustment in the floor plan view. If we kind of move back over into the floor plan view and we zoom in, 
you can see that I can pull that focal distance on and maybe I'll turn the layer on for that globe over here and I can make the adjustment so I can snap it right onto that globe. We go back into the camera itself and you can see that the focus is now right on that particular object, especially if we rotate around and look at the kitchen here. So that's a depth of field setting that can focus your eye on the scene you want to have front and center for you. Let's take a look at a variation of this that we can set up for an elevation view it's called depth queuing. Pretty similar. Let's close this view and I'm going to switch the save plan view into the kitchen and bath view so I can turn these cameras on. I have a section camera in here that is set to be back clipped so you can kind of see where camera K4 goes and it will back clip and I can turn that off so you wouldn't see the wall of cabinets and other items that are behind it. So you can control that. Let's open up the camera first and rather than back clip it so you don't see the back wall, we're using the depth cue, which is a fog-like element and still allows you to see the rest of the scene in here. You can access this underneath the 3D menu and then underneath camera view options and it's called the depth cue. When you open up the depth cue, you can then adjust the start and the end of this. So if I kind of slide this forward, you get the full, if this was an elevation camera, you get the full view and then if we pull that back so that we kind of shed that back in you can then see and you can start to pull back what you don't want to have in in view so that it's completely off this is a nice way to show the perspective of this let's go ahead and turn off the depth cue here now you see the full effect of the camera without a depth cue you can control the back clipping of this camera. So if I want to mask out where that view is, we can come back into the edit active view and there's an option in here to back clip. And once that's back clipped, it will then mask it out so you don't see it at all. So depending on what you want to do, you can use back clipping and the depth key. Let me undo a couple times here to produce the results that you'd like to have for your design or for your clients. The final portion for the seminar is how to create clipping for extended rooms or different shaped ceilings. You can see in this elevation view that I have in the sample plan, the Nashville ensuite, I've got both the shower and the bath area in one elevation and I don't have any of the platform information displayed. Let's take a look at how this works. To generate this view, I will typically use the elevation camera called the wall elevation. Let's begin in the shower and cut a section right through the shower wall. The advantage to using the wall elevation is it crops out the wall ends and the platforms for the ceiling and also the floor. The wall elevation camera is restricted to the room, however. To extend this into the bath area, Let's come up and edit the active view and then towards the bottom I'm going to end check the option to clip the scene to the room. Once I've done that I can then click very near the edge. You can see that I have a red selection handle. Be sure that it has the indication down here in the lower edit menu CAD clip lines. Then you can pull this out. Let's kind of zoom around a little bit so we can pull this out. I usually pull it quite a ways out so that I can see the clipping of the line of the wall and then I'll snap that back onto the wall and now I have it clipped exactly to the extended or elongated multiple set of rooms in this case. Let's take a look at one more example with a shaped ceiling. When I open up this camera you can see that it's got a multiple shaped ceiling as well as multiple extended rooms. In the floor plan view you can see that camera is right here. Let's look at the best way to generate that. Again since I don't want to see the platform information I will typically start with a wall elevation, cut the wall elevation through the wall that I'm looking at in the closet. In the edit active view I'm going to come down uncheck clip to room. Once clip to room is unchecked I'll then do a similar operation. I'll click very near the edge. You see the clip line is selected. I'll pull this out till it's quite a ways past the area. I'm going to zoom in, snap that to the wall finish layer. Then it's going to take a little bit of reshaping. 
Let's go ahead and pull this up and then I'm going to add a break line using the break tool. Line is selected. You see the red selection handle. Use the break line. Pull that down until it's parallel to the wall below. Zoom in. Pull the snapping onto the ceiling surface and then grab the move handle diamond. Pull that over until it's onto the surface and then I've got that clipped to both the extended room and then the shaped ceiling. That wraps up this session on camera settings for 2D and 3D. Hopefully you found some good takeaways you can save into your template plan and make your next design even more productive. Thanks for attending and watching. As you have questions, uh, be sure there's a raise hand option in your GoToWebinar control panel there. And when you raise your hand and we call on you, um, unmute your microphone and then uh, tell us uh, where you're from and maybe what uh, program you're running. And we'll see if we can get your question answered. So I'm going to hand it over to Carrie. Carrie, are there questions out there that uh, we can help with? Thanks, Scott. Um, while we're waiting for the questions to come in, we did have quite a few people write in before the webinar and suggest that they had struggled creating PBR renderings for interior scenes, and they were wondering if you could um, share some of the ideal settings that they could use. Okay, sure. Yeah, I saw that. Uh, that was a common question about how do you set up the ideal settings for your cameras and most of the time it depends on your scene what you do the scene that I have up on my screen now is a physically based render and let me just pull up a slide so we can kind of talk about the settings where I might start with so when you are looking at your settings and you can find most of these linked through the edit active view uh, that I touched on and for your defaults and you can actually set these in your defaults when you start a 3D view and then you can start to make adjustments. So let's just kind of walk through these. Turning on your ray casted shadows, it's important to have shadow information and adds depth in there. Make sure that you have lights. Uh, a lot of times if you do a design and you don't have any lights, you will need lighting to have a realistic view. Um, Make sure that the default lighting is turned on to 40 lights or something. I use light sets, which will force the program to turn on lights for a given room. Um, ambient inclusion, really not that important with PBR. I usually just set that to zero. And then the sun information, again, this is a function of what backdrop are you using? Are you using a sky model? What color is your backdrop? So it's difficult to say this is the exact setting. These are just the numbers I usually start with, but I'll turn the sun down quite a bit. Um, maybe in this particular case, set it down to 500. I'll then make sure that it works with the backdrop that I'm using, either an image or the sky model. And then the camera itself, there's an exposure setting where you can turn the exposure to a certain level. I'll start with the number 0.3. And just to kind of make that relative to the clay camera, I'll use a significantly brighter version for the K cam, the clay camera of about 0.8. If your computer supports ray tracing, obviously I have that set up to be on. And then the export samples or the uh, number of passes was set up to be 50. Those are caps, so it doesn't go on and on and, and set my computer uh, to overheat. And then the denoise option, which will remove speckles out of your glass, make sure that is checked. And then the backdrop intensity, which is the amount of light coming in from your backdrop, again, related to the type of backdrop you're using, is set here. So these are the typical numbers that I start with. And again, it will be scene dependent uh, and a function of what style of backdrop you're using. So hopefully this helps. These are all part of the Silverton sample plan. That's this kitchen that we have set up. So if you wanted to download that from the samples page and reverse engineer and look at those settings, this is just one particular plan you could take a look at. So hopefully that helps.
Carrie. Yes, thank you, Scott. Um, our first question is from Jeffrey. Go ahead and ask your question, Jeffrey. Yeah, hey, Scott. Um, I'm running, uh, well, it's Jeffrey from Victoria, BC, and uh, I'm running uh, Chief Architect uh, X15 with all the bells and whistles, I don't know, pro, exterior, interior, all that. Um, what I have a question is, is in uh, both PDR and, and vector view, uh, I'll create invisible walls, especially if I'm designing a bathroom and wanting to show the client what it looks like without uh, the confines of space and such. Uh, I can make the walls invisible, but what remains is doors, door trim, uh, fixtures, like if I've got uh, inset medicine cabinets, if I've got sconce lights, those objects remain even on the wall I make invisible, which obstructs the view, if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah, that's a common thing, Jeffrey. Yeah. How do, I, how do I get a good render of a small room? Um, sort of. Well, basically what I'm looking at is how to how to make those objects invisible mm. without making them disappear. Because what I can do is I can click, uh, say, remove interior fixtures to get mm -hmm. rid of the medicine cabinets, but that right. also gets rid of the toilet in the other on the other wall, that gets rid yeah. of the shower and all that sort of stuff, which I don't want to get rid of. Sure. I just want to see selected objects disappear yeah. or be made invisible without okay. having to then put them back into place before I close my program and have deleted them. All right. If this is something you do frequently, yes. um, you could build a layer set mm. and put certain items on a layer set. If you look at the scene I have up here, mm -hmm. I have a couple of different layers that I use here um, for accessories. So I have a few different accessory layers. Because when I do a maybe a wall elevation, I don't want to see a vase on the wall or mm. uh, flowers on the countertop. <clears throat> and so I'll put those on an accessory layer. So you could set certain things on different layers. I'm not suggesting accessories is the right layer. But you could put your items that you don't want to see on a layer. And then you could easily turn your layer set to be that specific one that they are turned off on. Okay. Can Does that I, make sense? Yes, a little bit. Uh, a sub point to that. Can I take specific doors and windows and put them on their own layer uh, and, and eliminate that as opposed to just like all doors, all windows, with even within that room? You can put doors, windows, uh, most all elements on their very specific layers. Hmm. What I'm talking about, though, is specific ones. Like, for example, sure. if I door on a south wall and a door on a north wall and okay. I'm making the south wall invisible okay. and I want to make that south door and it's trimmed invisible. Okay. Can I have that on a different layer than say the north door uh, and trim even if they're the same type of object if you if you get what I'm saying. Sure so if we just kind of map mm -hmm. out a small little um, room here let me grab my yeah. wall tool and I'm going to add actually one more little room in here so that it's super small because I did see this question come in quite a bit. So if you put a door on one side and you put a door on the other side, right? Yeah. And we open up one of these items. You can take that door and you can actually um, open it up. And on the layer panel here, right, you could come in and you could hit the define button make a copy of it, for lack of a better name, doors two, right? And so you can put it on that other layer. I see. Right? Right. And so when you take your uh, your 3D views, yeah. um, you know, one of the things that I'll also do is, do you ever use the cross-section slider? Um, not as much as I should. But so I've got a really small room in here. It might be a pantry or a closet or something. But one of the other tools you can use too is the cross-section slider tool mm -hmm. that will allow you to, as I open this up, let me grab the right tool here. And let's just slide this from once, let's actually slide it from the other side. And just pull that over a little bit. So you mentioned you don't wanna see the door or anything, right? So I could pull that in right about there, okay? And then once I close that, then you can kind of rotate around mm -hmm. and you can actually see right into the space. So this is another option to give you um, 
view into into a space. Right. Okay. So that could be an option for you as well, using the cross-section slider. Invisible walls, cross-section slider, um, the one that would probably also be a consideration is to hide the facing wall when you're rotating it. That doesn't necessarily take away a picture frame or something yeah. else that's on that wall. So there's a few options you can do in addition to building a layer set. Okay. Yeah. All right. Something okay. to think about. Yeah, that cross-section slider will give you six degrees of, um, I think it was, I think six degrees or so of ability to slice and dice your model here. Mm. Yeah. So right. see if that works out. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Well, that's, that's great. Thanks. All right. Thanks a lot. Carrie? Yes, Scott. Our next question is from Kate. Hi, Kate. Go ahead and ask your question. Hello, I'm Kate. I'm calling from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, I'm using Chief 15 Premier. Um, question about materials in physically based renderings. Um, oftentimes, and we when we pull these initial perspectives, a lot of the materials are either very reflective or very flat looking and don't have any dimension um, or any color. And in order to combat this, we've been going in individually and, and selecting the material and adjusting it to have a matte surface, for instance, or to have a different surface. And that allows it to have some color. But in general, all of our finishes look very reflective on, on the first perspective pull. Okay. Um, so just wondering if you have any initial initial advice. We haven't played around a lot with setting defaults, but would love your thoughts on that. So Kate, let me ask you a couple questions here. What camera view are you using to um, generate these scenes? Um, just a standard camera perspective. Okay, a standard camera perspective. Does it does it look any better if you switch over to the physically based? Well, physically based is where we are having our issues. It, it looks pretty fine in all of the views, and typically we render we, just for um, for meetings. We're rendering things in watercolor with a hand overlay drawing, just for concept. So it's not yeah. so specific, okay. and that usually looks lovely. Um, but with physically based, it we get those that flat the flat material surface. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's definitely happening in your physically based. Yeah. Are you um, are you using? Do you have electrical in your scenes? Uh, lighting? Yes, sometimes. Sometimes. Okay. Um, so just a couple things that I wanted to cover is, um, you know, in your camera settings, which we'll look at, the lighting, making sure that you have the sun and the light fixtures. I don't know if you noticed in my thing when I had the sun it set at a hundred thousand, the uh, number of a hundred thousand. My scene was completely washed out. Yeah. When I lowered that sun a, sun value, it made a big difference. Making sure that, depending on your on your um, model, if you have a bunch of lights, I usually will use a light set because sometimes the program will pick and choose lights. If you set your light number of lights in your scene to be forty. It might randomly pick those, and I want to be explicit, so I'll build a light set for the kitchen or the particular room. And then your material properties, you said you're looking at those. If we switch back over into the program, a lot of, I'll close this one, a lot of the things, if we grab one of the cameras here, let me just turn this on. This will look a little crazy for a minute, but let's just zoom in and pull one of these cameras out and open it up. So if we open up um, a camera that I have here saved, and I'm just using the sample plan uh, from the website called the Silverton. So when I open this up, and you mentioned you're already clicking on materials like the countertop, and you're adjusting those, right? And yeah. on the properties, you're coming in and making adjustments to you know, the type of material and the other information. A lot mm -hmm. of, are these materials that you're using from our library? Or are these custom materials you're importing? 
it's library materials. Um, okay. We do make a lot of our own materials, and we've learned now to set that set those um, parameters a little bit to to help this. But a okay. lot of it is library. Okay. Materials. I think a lot of our library materials are typically set up with properties that work very well. Sometimes you may want to, you know, increase or decrease the, you know, amount of reflectivity or something on a countertop. But, you know, I would maybe just revisit. And you're you're happy to send. We're happy to look at your plan if you want to send it in. But this edit active view tool kind of gives you a peek into all of the settings that you can adjust with. So show shadows with raycast, the sunlight information, and then the light set, and then specifically for all the camera settings that I kind of covered with the initial question, your exposure, the amount of light coming in from the backdrop, these are, you know, particular things that can really make the outcome of your render, you know, dialed in. But if you want to well, well yeah, we can do a little bit of experimentation and see if we can, yeah. and, and otherwise it can be in touch. Yeah, you can send your plan in. Um, I'll be happy to take a look at it and um, see if there are particular settings that I can point you towards that might improve your rendering. I would start with, I don't know if you were able to do a screen grab of those initial settings that I had up that I'll, I'll just bring it up in case you'd like to. But these yeah, are the settings that, these are the settings I kind of start with for a in interior scene that's physically based ray trace. So these are the settings I start with. Uh, I usually always change them again, depending on what the scene uh, is and, and all the other variables. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. All right, Scott, our next question is from Norman. Norman, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Hey, Scott, it's Norman from New Zealand, and I'm using X15. Okay, good. Is it is it morning or night there? Uh, it's actually a respectable uh, 8.30 in the morning. Okay, well, good morning. Thank you. Um, it was good to see the slider used because I used to do that to hide wall facing camera so thanks for that can you run through if we were to add a backdrop to try and get a photograph from a particular scene so when you do your view looking out through the window you get a kind of realistic view yeah let me um let me just see if i can pull an example here oh boy let me just a second here. Okay. So if I grab an example, let me just grab this plan here. I guess I can not drag it into there. Let's close this. So let's just take a 3D view, and your your goal is to talk about um, a backdrop, right? Yep. So I typically, when I set up my camera defaults, I don't like to have a backdrop. Uh, I like to have them just blank and white, as you can kind of see in this view, right? And so this view is very dark. There's nothing exciting about the rendering because it's fast and it's quick to edit in. So I like to personalize the renderings for the client. And when you're out on the job scene, it's nice to be able to just take your cell phone and snap a picture of, you know, maybe the front, the back sides of the house that you can see. And I'll build a, uh, for the client, I'll build a backdrops folder. And then, to, are, are you comfortable with importing a backdrop, Norman? Yep. Okay, so you just kind of right click and you say new and then backdrop and kind of walk through the dialogue. So I've imported one here. And once you have put that in, then you can click in the window, right? And place that into the scene. 
and then you can make adjustments into it. Oops. And then that can be saved with the camera. And I mentioned I take one out the back, maybe out the sides. So that can be saved with the camera. So when you recall the the camera, it's embedded with the uh, with that saved camera. Cool. Yeah. So it's a pretty easy process. I try to not get plants or something that are right close to the camera, and that way it looks uh, a little more realistic. Okay, cool. And just spherical. That's obviously mm -hmm. you've got to you've got to have some form. It's it's great if you're starting on an empty lot and you can yeah. get a spherical camera. Right. But if you, if you're doing an as built, you're obviously restricted because you can't pick up a spherical camera if there's already a, a building in place. Yeah, it's not easy to do. Um, I used a drone for one of my shots that flew up above, but it's you know not maybe as realistic. All right, cool. Thanks so much. Good. To okay. Catch yeah. Up thanks. Again. For, yeah. Our next question is from Adam Gibson. Go ahead and ask your question, Adam. Hey, Scott. Can you hear me? Hey, Adam. I, I've, I'm a little embarrassed to ask this, considering I've been using this program probably as long as you worked for Chief, which has got to be approaching 30 years by now. Yeah, probably Something. longer. But I, how did you toggle the the lines on and off on the well on all the renderings? You just toggled show lines and don't show lines what did you have a hotkey or something uh you can um well in a version we have coming up there is a hotkey for it but if you go to edit active view and you hit the camera define button then you just toggle the line on and then bang it's on right that's what yeah. i do but yep. I, it looked like you did it without going to the dialog uh i'm i can do that in uh, in a in an, in an upcoming version. We've added a hotkey for it, as well as a tool that you can put on your toolbar. Okay. Um, I probably just did it quickly and um, so that, you know, maybe my dialogue was off the screen when I did that. Okay, that answers, you're, you're, not that I know anything about pretty, that. You must have been pretty observant to, to grab that one though, thanks. <laughs> well, because <laughs> I, I, all the time I'm toggling it on and off for the exact yeah. reason you do. And uh, exactly. I was like, wait, there's a button? Yeah, well, there there will be a button. I can yeah, tell I'm, you that. I can't say I'm whether I'm privy to that upcoming release or not. Yeah. But thank <laughs> you very much. Yeah. Well, if you are, check it out. All right, take care. All right, thanks, Adam. See you in August. Okay, good. All right, our next question is from Rebecca. Hi, Rebecca, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Rebecca, Charleston, South Carolina, X15. I don't remember if it's Premier Interiors, but I see these great videos on Instagram and so forth, and I take them with my cell phone, and you can only imagine how pixelated they are when you're taking a video of the computer screen uh -huh. and how unprofessional they look. Uh -huh. So I wrote in asking how if Chief Architect could take pictures or videos that I could upload to social media okay so you're and looking you're are you looking for videos that we create that you can upload or you want to create your own videos and upload them i want to create videos and and or photos of my current projects to upload sure okay do you um let me close this view rebecca do you create let me grab this one do you create walkthrough paths that's what she's i haven't ever I do the um, when you send the 3D walkthrough where you export it and I've emailed that to clients, but I've never done a what you're asking me now. Right. So if you let's see if I've got this here, which is this is going to be like next level game changing for me. Let's see if you can see this. So this walkthrough path is what I'm what I've recorded. This is exactly what I'm wanting to upload. Yes. Okay, so let me pause that and let's go back in. So this is that walkthrough path and it's in our sample plan if you wanna look at it. But if you open this up by going into here, um, 
you can look at each one of these keyframes. There's also a preview panel. So you can set each one of these up. Let me open up my, so underneath your 3D is a tool to create walkthroughs, okay? So that's how you create those. We have a specific article and video on creating these. So I'm only gonna kind of point you to a couple of these things. There's a preview that's panel fine. that I use a lot. And if I open up the preview in here, takes a minute this is a little bit more time consuming but this allows you to kind of make sure that you've got the right view I've got it in a lower resolution you can kind of see how I tip the camera down look in the sink right rotate around and so when you have your settings in here you can change the speed of the camera the style of the camera the resolution of the camera you can set you know I've got, I've recorded this with physically based, what backdrop you want to have in here. So all of those settings go into creating a video that looks, well, I guess it went black after that. <laughs> there it goes. So all of those settings went into creating this particular view. I usually record them pretty slowly. So if you want to learn about those, see, I don't know, if maybe the folks out there can chat out a video or a, a support article on how to create those. Does that work for you? That's amazing. Perfect. Okay. Well, thanks for calling in today. I chatted out a video on how to make walkthroughs. Okay. And our next question is from Eric. Go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. All right, let's check in with Vicki. Hi, Vicki, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, hi, Scott, can you hear me? Hi, hi Vicki, yeah. Um, I always have trouble with a backdrop seeming out of scale with the model when I'm doing an exterior. Mm -hmm. um, I'll pick a backdrop that I think looks appropriate and then my, my um, model seems to be like floating in air or too low or the backdrop i wish it were further away mm -hmm. via, via the camera mm -hmm. how do you adjust those um well i guess my initial answer you probably won't like is to be a better photographer <laughs> um, in our program we don't necessarily have a way to adjust backdrops but one of the things that I'll do is I'll create a solid and spray it on a solid outside the window. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. And I'm talking about the backdrops that are in chief. Okay. <clears throat> let me just, uh, let me grab a simple little plan here. <clears throat> so if we were to look at Let's just uh, take a peek at this one. I don't know what this is, but it's a simple little design, right? So this backdrop is uh, sky and clouds that I have set up here. Can you can and you do we, an exterior? Okay, sure. Of this? Okay, I don't know what it looks like. We'll, we'll that's that. where I, that's where I have problems. Okay, so here's my exterior. So you want a backdrop that looks good with an exterior? Do you have landscape? uh usually i have at least a terrain and then i'll add landscape once i see how the whole thing looks yeah so it would be important because if i have no terrain in this case right i'd want to make right. sure that you know we create a terrain perimeter <clears throat> and then um from the backdrop you're saying you use our backdrops and you don't care for them um right? some of them are okay but yeah. when i use one uh -huh. it just seems to be way out of proportion to mm -hmm. the model that I have okay. so yeah see that's like <laughs> yeah well it doesn't look right <laughs> don't don't use it um, <laughs> uh, these are just example backdrops um, chances are when you design a house is is it bend you're from yeah yeah those houses in Bend don't look like that, do they? I know. <laughs> so, so, so take your take your phone and take you know a backdrop, and again, try not to get something too close to the foreground, because mm -hmm. then it 
looks bad um, and it's not easy to adjust unless you put it on a solid and then put that solid out the window or behind the house then it's you can kind of make it appear that way um, but I wouldn't encourage you to use our backdrops for making it personalized for a client that's that's where you can go out there and take a photo and and mess around with it so you kind of know how they work and then when you drop them in it looks better right yeah I have done that with some clients um, right now I'm trying to work on stock plans so mm -hmm. location isn't as important ah, okay uh, yeah. but proportion is mm -hmm. and some of them like um, you know one of the overlooks for instance or like uh, rolling hills Okay, uh, Rolling Hills. Like yeah. How would you how would you take that model and set it in there so it looked right? Well, does that look okay? No. Oh. It looks to me like it's floating up in the air over the scenery. Yeah. Um. It you you're gonna have to probably adjust your camera perspective because if you pull this down, right, it looks worse. Uh, you adjust well, it. Well, see, now it looks in proportion. It's just a, just in the wrong yeah. angle. There, there's also a setting in here to extend the terrain to the horizon. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that helps. It depends on your scene. Um, that it will extend it out to the horizon. That's a little better. Yeah. Yeah. So I would try and take your own photos. Yeah. That's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> or you can. I mean, you can also connect with. Um, some of these sites, uh, some of the photographers that sell them pretty inexpensively, or there's even fair use rights that you can find free photos on. Yeah. And then you can use those, and then it's super easy to import these into the program. Right. Yeah. I might try your idea of pasting it onto a solid and see if that works. Yeah. But otherwise, yeah, I guess I need to get my camera out. Or, or your cell phone. What? Well, true. One and the same these days. Yeah. Okay. Hey, thanks, hey, Scott. Hey, Scott, I had a couple yeah. of uh, yeah, a sure. thought for Vicky there. Hi, Vicky. De Derek here. Um, Hi, Derek. So the the extended terrain that Scott did there, I think that works really well. If he pulls that down a little bit, it will blend a little bit more with the grass on that particular scene and adjust that. And the other thing I tend to like to do is putting a fence in on the terrain will really help to manage the, the depth of the terrain versus the backdrop behind it. So yeah. putting a fence in there will help to kind of blend that in, you know, along that horizon line along with the uh, extended terrain like what he has there is is looking a lot better yeah i've i've done that also and then once you put your own trees trees in exactly in the background that helps too yep yep yeah hey thanks derek yep ready for a couple more questions scott yeah, why don't, um, actually, why don't we do this? Uh, I like to be respective of people's time. And um, so I'm going to give you a little bit of information on um, closing this out. And then we'll come back and do a couple more questions. I see a few hands raised out there. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank everybody for attending today's session. And um, I, I wanted to make you aware of, of resources if these aren't uh, things you're aware of. We do one-on-one -on -one training um, that can be very effective. If you're struggling with rendering or uh, any other aspect of the program, we do one-on-one -on -one training. We screen share, and so with one of our instructors here, we can take your questions specifically and, 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 and answer those. You can find that information on the website. Super effective and a great way to uh, make the most of your time. We have lots of videos. We have a video link on our website. Um, co complementing those is a knowledge base articles that are available. And then we do training that is both in person and online. One of the events that we have coming up, if I can get to it here, is the Chief Academy that will be in August here in Coeur d'Alene. And it's a variety of introductory, intermediate, advanced training. So those are available um, 
and filling up quickly if you want to take advantage of it. Our online training, if you want to do that at any time, those are classes that you can learn on. And uh, yeah, just wanted to make you aware of those things. So we'll um, be sending out an email with the link to today's session that will also include a survey. So you can look for that in the next day or so. And if you do need to leave, um, thanks for attending. If you're leaving and you still have questions, you can email those in to sales at Chief Architect. If you'd like to uh, get those taken care of, we'll take a look at them for you. So we'll come back and take a few more questions. Let me get back here and then Carrie can uh, um, fill the questions for us. Carrie? Yep. Our next question is from Catherine. Hi, Catherine. Go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. I was just about to write an email. Um, <laughs> Thanks for having me. I'm from Essex Junction, Vermont. I might not have a great question because I'm just messing with lights and not being able to turn them on. Hmm. And I've gone to light data, I've gone to my view, I've gone to edit, to adjust lights, turn them on, turn them on spot, turn them on point. Um, okay. They're all clicked on, but they don't look like they're on. So I didn't they know don't look like they're on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is it a plan with lots of lights, Catherine? It is. I mean, it has, I think it said 56 lights okay. and I could adjust them. Uh -huh. All right. Have you built a light set? I, I have. I've gone to light set Okay. and it says default light set, but then I can go to adjust light. So I haven't created a light set, so that might yeah. be helpful. Yeah. So if we look at this uh, simple little plan that I have up here, um, let's switch over to the electrical view. Let's see if there's any electrical in here. Yeah, so there's a handful of lights in here. There's not a lot. However, mm -hmm. these strip lights, these LED strip lights underneath the cabinets have a lot of lights on them. If you zoom in, there's a light every, I don't know, foot or so. And um, if we take a look, and let's just generate a 3D view inside this scene here. Let's see what we have. So there's a handful of lights here. and when you're looking at this, you can click on the light and then in your lower edit toolbar, I'll kind of mouse over this, there's an on or off option that you can kind of discover if it's on or off, right? Oh, okay. And then what I like to do, this is a pretty, pretty simple plan, so there's not a lot of lights, but there's probably maybe close to 75 or so, I would guess, is to build a light set. And when you go into your edit active view, underneath lighting, currently it's set to use 20 lights. And we know that there's way more than 20 lights given that those LED strip lights are underneath there. So specifically, I could crank that up to 100 and mm -hmm. that might solve the problem, I'm turning on a bunch of lights in here, right? Yeah. Um, but I actually like to build a light set, especially if you've got a more sophisticated model. So you can come into the light set and when you hit adjust lights, it does say default, but you can say, you know, um, make a copy of that. And then you can build one that you can then explicitly say, oh, apparently I already have one called kitchen, but that's how you create it. And then you can explicitly turn those lights on and off and then you can switch this over to say, hey, look, look, use this grouping of lights, and then you will know that it's always on. Cool. And I, pref I prefer to do it that way, especially if you've got a couple of rooms and there are several lights, and then I just know explicitly those lights should be turned on. That's great. Um, and I just learned a whole bunch, especially that on off. Yeah. Of course, it's still not working, so I don't no. know if it's just the okay. light fixture. And also note, some lights can have multiple lights in them. If I open up this particular pendant light, and on the light data, this only has one light, but there's some chandeliers that might have, I don't know, pick a number, 20 lights in there, and those can all be turned on and off independently. So depending on what that is and then also the light location if I tip this up you can see where that light is turned on mm -hmm. and then I could explicitly say well show me that in the 3d view 
And now you can kind of verify where that light's coming on. Sometimes I've seen people maybe stretch a particular light and then the light is maybe not where they think it is. So that's a way that you can kind of verify where that light is by just going in here and turning it on in the camera position. So you might peek at that as well. Great. Yep. And okay. if you're still having problems, uh, just give us a shout. Thanks, Scott. Yep. Thanks a lot. All right, Scott, our next question is from Chelsea. Hi, Chelsea. Go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Hello, I'm Chelsea. Hi. I'm working out of Washington State. Okay. Um, I work with a large team and we all use Chief Architect. Um, I focus on just the rendering side. So they build the home models and then I do the rendering in-house. Um, so they've got a, a very complex and beautiful template set up for their side, but it doesn't include the settings that I need to use regularly. So I've figured out a way to import um, like specific layer sets for when I'm doing the landscaping and different things. I'm wondering if there's a way to have my defaults show up because I work in a ton of different plans. Okay. If I can have some of these camera settings as my default anytime I open, excuse me, open a plan without mm -hmm. them having to adjust their template. Right. Is that possible? Well, one of the things you could do, Chelsea, um, if I understand it right, is you could open up their plan and mm -hmm. you could modify the defaults for the camera. So there's a couple of different things at the beginning of the session. I kind of talked about uh, the settings for sunlight and 3D views and then camera tools also. So all of these settings, if you wanted to adjust the sun information, right? You could do that and then your rendering techniques if you wanted to come in here and specifically set the defaults up that work well for your typical scene then those can all be saved as a default in there and then when you take your initial 3d view it would leverage those settings do i have to set that in every plan i open if you started in their template plan you would not Okay. Does that does that make sense? Do you do you know where the template plan is located? Yes. Okay. So if you go to um, your preferences, right, just for the benefit mm -hmm. of everybody else, underneath your preferences is a setting for new plans. Um, and currently, I just finished a class up, so mine's called my template. Yours would be called something else template. But if you were to just uh, do a new plan. You can make settings in there just by simply guy by going to do new new plan, um, making the changes in here. So if we just went into the settings and we said, you know, for the uh, for the sunlight, let's say we adjusted that to seventy five thousand, and then we did a file template, save as template, then we can kind of just step on that existing one. Um, with only updating the sunlight information, I'll just remove CAD details and sun and then set that as my template. And um, yeah, we'll just go ahead and that's fine. Call it that. And now when I start a new plan and you look at my default settings, it should have that sunlight set at 75,000 for all new plans. So as long as you do it in the template plan, then it's done and those initial settings will be cooked in there and save you a bunch of time, hopefully. Oh, sorry. I guess my question, I'm using plans that they've already created. Okay. And I make so, a copy and they've already built it in a template. Okay, so if they've already done it, obviously mm -hmm. it's past the fact and you can, okay. you'll have to open up those plans. But for the very next one, before they start on it, if you make that change, mm -hmm then you can save some time on those. Okay. Hey, Scott. Yeah, and then I'll let a Adrian chime in with, a, with an additional option. It might save you some time here. Uh, I'm not sure if this would be terribly time-saving, but one option that you might be able to do is copy your a perspective camera that you've set up and that you really like from one of your existing projects and just paste its location uh, into the project you're working on. I 
believe it will preserve most of the settings, but you would just need to change the location after that. That's a great idea. Yeah, I yeah. will write that down and give that a shot. Appreciate it. Okay, thanks, Chelsea. All right, Scott, we have one last question and that comes from Pinky. Hi, Pinky, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. All right, it looks like that's it for today. Did you have any other announcements, Scott? Okay, well, thanks, Carrie. Thanks everybody for attending today. Uh, the session will be recorded. We'll send out a link to this as well as survey and you'll see that in the next day or so. So we appreciate your time in, uh, in attending today. Um, just a couple of things, just to reiterate, one-on-one -on -one trainings available if you'd like to be productive and do screen sharing. Our videos, our knowledge-based articles are also good resources. And then our training that's in person, uh, in, in person and online, our next session that we have that will be coming up will be the Chief Academy that is an in-person session end of august and a variety of levels of training that you can attend and hopefully we'll see you in Coeur this summer and again thanks everybody for attending have a great day and we'll see you soon